thank you ladies. And the offertory music was beautiful on that electric piano as well. Just very thankful for all the musicians that share their talents with us here on the Lord's Day. Um, <clears throat> so keep your copy of God's Word open. We're going to be in Romans again. I wanted to look back at some of my sermon notes because they can usually give me a good introduction to our last sermon. And But they only just give me some, some good feedback, but, but they give me, some, again, great artistry. I've got the pulpit here. I've got the electric piano. I've got the, I've got the, I've got the whole thing with the, the computer, uh, the speakers. And then, of course, you've got to have a tractor when you're having all that. So thank you, Case. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, and then this one from another one of our young people. There is nothing to boast about in and of ourselves. It, is always, it has always been and forever will be about God. And that, I think, was at the heart of our message last week, that it was God that called Abraham. There was nothing special in and of Abraham or in his life or something that God would desire him, but it was God who called and chose him. Another one, the main theme of Scripture is redemption. God called Abraham. That's what made him special. It's all about God from start to finish. I basically just repeated myself. And finally, God has to choose you. You do not choose him. You can choose to follow him, question mark. <laughs> so here's the deal. Yes, God chooses you. But then God gives you new desires. God gives you a new heart. God gives you a heart to follow him and to be his disciple. So yes, you choose then to follow Christ because he gave you the desire to follow him. So uh, that was one of our young people asked about that. If we need to talk more after, please come and see me. But I really, really appreciate the, no the sermon notes that the kids do every week. Uh, it lets me know, because I can know when I've had a bad week, because I get no real good, good response. But praise the Lord. So this morning, back in Romans, what I want to look at is this idea that last week, I said that one of the main themes of the whole of Scripture is redemption. All of the Bible really is about a broken relationship between God and man, which has been restored through the vicarious life, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is a story of two different types of relationships. Relationship of men who are in opposition to the Lord, who are in rebellion to the Lord, and men, women, and children who have been redeemed to God and had their relationship made right with the Lord God. Now the point is, though, how is that accomplished? And we've been looking here in Romans and seeing the condition of man. And last week, as we saw, God accounted it to, to uh, Abraham as righteousness because he believed the promise. And then it says that idea of accounted to him. So what we didn't look deeply at is what is imputation? What is this accounting? How exactly does that take place? So today Paul is going to show us that blessed are those whose sins, lawless deeds are forgiven, and in particular, how they are forgiven. Now, you know, often as I do a sermon, I try to think about what would be a good uh, story or something to introduce us that will kind of give us the same idea that's in the text. I could not do any better than the story of this very small New Testament book of Philemon. Philemon is about reconciliation of relationships between two Christians. Onesimus was a slave who had run away and robbed his, uh, his, his boss, Philemon. And, uh, but apparently what had happened, it wasn't enough that he ran away. And again, slavery, I don't want to get into the whole slavery thing. Slavery in the first century back then, a lot of it could be just uh, servants and or they owed a certain amount of money and they worked it off in servitude. But so let's not, don't get caught up in the slave part of it, but let's get caught up in the story part of it. What you have is you have a guy who's at a much higher level of society and Onesimus, who's at the very lowest rung of society. And he had robbed his, his boss, Philemon, and he had run away from him. And what had happened, though, in the meantime, he had come to faith. 
Somehow he came across the Apostle Paul, who preached the gospel to him, and he came, as it were, again to faith. So apparently Paul wrote this letter at the same time as he did to the one written to the Colossians, and he sends this letter in Onesimus' hand to carry it to Philemon. But Paul appealed to Philemon to accept Onesimus back into his household, but as a brother in the Lord rather than a slave. It wasn't enough that he was asking Philemon to receive him, to forgive him, but he's asking him to receive this slave back into his home, not just as a slave now, but as a brother in Christ. And very honestly, that is what it's like for the lost sinner like you and me. We are slaves to sin. We are in rebellion to our Lord and Master. And Christ makes a way for us to be redeemed back into a relationship. Not just a relationship of forgiveness, but a relationship of family. A relationship of love. And this is very much at the heart of this letter that Paul wrote to Philemon. He appealed to him to accept him. Not just as uh, forgiving and making him a slave, but a brother. Verse 11 says, Now that he was a Christian... Uh, Paul even promised to pay whatever Onesimus had, had, had owed him. Verse 11, we'll look at that. But Paul says this, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, to Philemon. That was uh, the, uh, Onesimus' uh, slave owner. Beloved friend and fellow laborer. He says, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such as... One is Paul the aged, and now also the prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who I have begotten while in chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now he is profitable to you. And this is what the story of salvation does. It takes people who are completely unprofitable, that are completely in rebellion to God, and it makes us right with God and makes our lives worthful again. Worthy. Worthy of a relationship with the living God and a reconciliation to, uh, to our Lord. And so here is this relationship that Paul is talking about. I could just imagine what Philemon's thinking as he gets this letter uh, out of Onesimus' hand. Maybe he sees Onesimus coming his way, and his heart's probably stirred in all the wrong ways. But then once he reads this and hears that Onesimus has been completely redeemed and reconciled, so he goes, I'm sending him back. And really the story of the gospel is bringing us back from the brink of destruction and into that right relationship. So he says this, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. <laughs> that, that he departed, but that now you might receive him forever. The nature of salvation is one that is eternal. It's repairing relationships, not for a day, not for a week, not for a lifetime, but for all eternity, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave again, but much more than a slave, a beloved brother, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now here's where the story really captures the heart of what Paul is going to be teaching us here in this portion of Romans. This idea of imputed righteousness, of credited, reckoned, accounted. There's going to be a double accounting. Our sins imputed, accounted, reckoned on Christ's account, what we owed, and his righteousness then imputed to the believer, paying the debt that we could never pay. It's really, uh, it's about accounting. <laughs> it's about making the books right and clean. See, God is perfectly holy. He cannot just wink at sin. It has to be rectified. It has to be made right. And we could never do enough to make things right. So this is where Paul says this to Philemon. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. And that's what happens. We owe God a great debt. And you know what? He puts it on Christ's account. If we owe anything, it's paid in full in Christ. 
And here Paul is sending, and think about Onesimus, a, a slave on the run who had stolen from his master, who comes to Christ, and now Paul counts him as a brother. And not just a brother, but he's going to bat for Onesimus. Whatever he owes you, Philemon, I'll pay you back. That's what the gospel's about. It's about payback in full and, and amazingly. This is a story just about Philemon and Paul and Onesimus. But when we're talking about whatever little money that he paid, owed, we owe an infinite amount. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand, I will repay. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your own life. So he, he throws in a little bit there. Don't forget there, Philemon. You owe everything to me, brother. Like, I'm sure he led him to the Lord as well. Because there's nothing we have in this life that's nearly as valuable, and we'll find out, as we have our forgiveness with God. So today, if it were Sesame Street again, our word of the day is imputation. Holman's Dictionary says this, The righteousness imputed or reckoned to believers is, strictly speaking, an alien righteousness. It has to be alien because our distance between God and man is infinite. And there's absolutely nothing in or resonant within a person that could ever bridge that distance. So it must be an alien righteousness. It is not the believer's own righteousness, but God's righteousness imputed to the believer. So as Martin Luther would say, believers are simultaneously righteous and sinful. <laughs> in and of ourselves, we are sinful. And even after we come to Christ, we still sin. We're telling the story about Abraham. Abraham was counted righteous, right? Because he believed God. Well, just in a chapter or two from uh, Genesis 15, he's going to commit adultery with Hagar and sin grievously. But his, his righteousness is not in and of himself. It's never something he works up. And even when he falls, God makes a way for the believer to be made right again with him. So stand with me as we look at this portion of scripture. I want to look at Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Verses 1 through 3 will give us context. And then I'm going to focus on verses 4 and following. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless sins are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Let's pray. Father God, we stand in awe of the great and immeasurable love that you've shown to us in Christ. That you, Father God, have so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should have life and life everlasting. Father, we thank you for this great goodness. We thank you that Abraham is such a lesson to us that what you've done for Abraham, you do for all of those that you call and those that you bless with the gift of faith and that you make completely and totally right with you, taking our sins upon Christ on that cross and then imparting a righteousness that is alien to us so that we might be in right standing with the living, just, and holy God. Father, I pray you'd open our hearts today as we look at this portion of Scripture. I pray that you might be glorified and that, Father, we might ever and grow in love for you 
as we begin to understand, open our hearts that we might comprehend the infinite love and value of what you've done for us in the cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I want to look and see three points. Works righteousness, imputed righteousness, blessed are the righteous. We know again that verse 3, quoting back from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what I really want to kind of zero in now on is this accounted righteousness, this imputed righteousness. It's really a forensic count, accounting of God declaring men, women, and children of faith righteous and totally doing away with what was held against them before this living and righteous and holy God. Verse 4 there says of chapter 4, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as death. So Paul is going to compare work and not working. And when someone works and puts in a good week's work, you can expect that you should get a good week's pay. And your boss shouldn't think he's doing you some favor. You've earned that work week's pay. You deserve what you're, you're getting. It's not a matter of grace, it's a matter of debt. Now, of course, we can work hard, and there's times where, where bosses really appreciate our hard work, and they give us a bonus, maybe at Christmas time. I always thought about Christmas, and my boss would give me a bonus. But I still would think in my head, you know what? I've made a lot more money than that. I've even earned that bonus. <coughs> so work is work, and you earn what you earn. But when he's talking here again about a righteousness before God, we could never earn or work hard enough. Remember, he has nothing to boast in, Abraham does, before God, because we could never ever make up that distance. So I think we, we very clearly see in these first four chapters of Romans that no man could ever be good enough to earn righteousness. You could never have a works righteousness. The bottom line is that we have a debt so insurmountable, we could never, ever work it off. We could never, ever work it off. And the strange things is about religion, so much religion is works-based. And, and you know what it is, why it is like that? Because we feel better when we do something. <laughs> we feel like we've done something to earn God's respect or love. And that's why we have got to completely embrace what the Lord is teaching here. There are not a good, enough good deeds if you were to work from now until eternity to put yourself back into right standing with a perfectly holy God. So works is always of debt. But if you're not working, it's all of grace. It's all of mercy. It's all of what God is calling us to. So just, again... Paul made it clear in Romans chapter 3.20 that works righteousness is completely a myth. It simply does not exist. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul has gone to great lengths to show us that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That if we even broke one sin of a holy God, we could never make amends in and of ourselves. We're destined for hell. We're destined for death. You could never work it back. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah puts it this way about, about our good works. But we are like an unclean thing, and all our, our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And if I were to explain that, it's, it's even filthy rags doesn't do justice to what our good works are before God. We could never, ever please a holy God or make things right with him. Paul made it very clear. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. Do you know what we've earned? What we've earned is death. If man has done any work <laughs> worth anything, which is only worth to gain us death. We've worked awfully hard as man to sin and to sin and to sin some more. So if we were to get actually what we deserve, what we've worked for, our day's pay, it would be death. 
hell in the grave. It being eternity separated from the living God. Because that's how we work in and of ourselves. And if you think you're going to add some work to that that's righteousness, there's absolutely nothing. So reconciliation with God must be all of grace and not of debt. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's why it's the righteousness of God. It's not the righteousness of James or, 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 or any of us. We could never. It has to be an alien righteousness that is given to us, being justified freely. That's that grace. Work is of debt. Salvation, though, is of grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This distance, again, between this perfectly holy God and sinful man is infinite. We could never, ever work or do enough to make amends. That's why, though, <laughs> imputation and salvation that comes through not working is ever so much more wonderful. So let's look at point two, imputed righteousness. Romans 4, 5 to 6 says this. And again, you see Paul comparing work and non-work. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. So first we want to recognize that this righteousness is going to have to be accounted or imputed apart from works. There cannot be a mixture of grace and works. It's got to be all of grace. Because we all know if it's not all of grace, we start to take a little bit of the credit. And one of the wonderful glories of the gospel and what Christ has done in paying the penalty, imputing righteousness to us is God will always ever only get the glory. Amen. And we won't. And if we begin to embrace this and understand it rightly, it will develop a humility in us, a true humility. It's going to need to be all of grace. The means by which the righteousness is imputed is through faith and believing. You can see there from what Paul is saying. For the, to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. So again, that begins to seem like there's something we bring to the table. This faith. But we know, we've looked at this as we've been going through it. Faith is a gift from God. This faith is an empty-handed faith. It's not something that you've done in and of yourself. So like, I think it was Alexis who asked, you know, do, do, we, do we follow, choose to follow God? We would never choose to follow God. We would always ever choose to rebel against God. So God draws us out of death, grants us the grace to believe that even your faith is not of yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a work of God in and through you. The idea of faith and believing is not a work through. It is a reliance and trusting in what Christ has done on our behalf. It's not something we're doing in and of ourselves. It's placing it on what Christ has done. The faith which is a gift from God is completely <coughs> resting upon the finished work of Christ. So that way, again, all of grace. Since we could never earn salvation, God has won salvation on our behalf. Now, all those who are accounted as righteousness, righteous and have righteousness imputed to them, it's all of God. So who boasts? We boast in God. Mm -hmm. We give glory alone to God because of that. The idea of faith and believing is not work at all. It's complete and total reliance upon God. It's trusting in and believing in him, what he has done for us. And this is where folks that are religious get mixed up because they, their faith is something you do. It is something you do. You do place your faith. You repent of your sin and you put faith in Christ. You say, Lord God, forgive me for my sin. Thank you that Jesus died for, on my behalf. Thank you that he paid the penalty on the cross. And you're believing all this. And we're coming and making confession. In Romans chapter 10, it's going to say, if you believe in your heart, and confess it with your mouth, you shall be saved. It sounds like something we're doing. But folks, even that is a <coughs> gift of God. 
So it's just hard to, to, to delineate it. But where folks get off as Christians and believers, they start to think their faith is something that they're working up. And even after they come to faith, they think they're doing something to help God. I remember when I first became a Christian, I thought, that's it. I'm good. I'm going to go win the world for Christ. I'm going to be the next Billy Graham. The wonderful thing was God let me do a Facebook <coughs> because you cannot do it in and of yourself. It has to be a complete and total reliance upon Christ for salvation and for the grace to walk that salvation out. Robert Haldane, the Scottish theologian, says this, Righteousness is what we want in order to justification. Right? That's what we want. We want to be made just. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as testified in the gospel, is the means through which we receive this righteousness. Believing, then, is not the righteousness, but is the means through which we become righteous. We can't get those mixed up. We get those mixed up, and you know what? All of a sudden, imputed righteousness is out the window. We've got to go back to the drawing board and figure out what's really going on here. It's a firm and complete re uh, reliance on him. Believing, then, is not the righteousness, but it is the means through which we become righteous. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. It's always all of grace. It's always nothing of us. 2 Corinthians goes even further. For the love of Christ compels us. What compels you? The love of Christ compels you. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. It completely sets you on a new course. It completely gives you new desires, new loves. Now it's Christ who compels you to love and to obedience. Now we're no longer living for ourselves. We're living for the one who died for us and who rose again from the dead. And then he makes it stark here. This is the imputation that's going on, this imputed righteousness. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. If we don't come to that faith, and if it's not all of God, that sin is going to be placed upon us. We who will know sin and will pay for that sin. But when imputed righteousness happens, all the sin that you deserve and the penalty for it is placed upon him. And then look at the next part, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There is a great exchange. <laughs> it's not enough just that he takes our sin, he makes us righteous in Christ. But you can't get, get kind of sideways and start to think, I'm righteous. I'm not righteous. Christ is righteous. When he looks on us, he sees Christ the Father. That's what he sees. That's, that's the, the imputed. Sin is imputed to Christ for us, and righteousness is imputed to us. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. John MacArthur, and I can quote John MacArthur now finally, because I've had commentaries that I'm reading when I'm going through Romans, and John gave me this book, <laughs> MacArthur's first volume of Romans. You all know I cannot read books. So I gave that back to John, and I bought the digital version. So <laughs> I'm now able to read MacArthur along with Romans. So here's what John MacArthur says. Was reckoned, that was accounted to him, carried the economic and legal meaning of crediting something to another's account. The only thing God received from Abraham was his imperfect faith. Get that? Our faith even is always ever imperfect. <laughs> it's never perfect. But by his divine grace and mercy, let me say that again. The only thing God received from Abraham was his imperfect faith. But by his divine grace and mercy, he reckoned it to Abraham's spiritual account as righteousness. God has never provided any means of justification except through faith in him. Amen. Right? Faith is just a vehicle. It's just a method to get us where we need to get to. Isaiah, and then of course, 
if you want to look at what does imputed righteousness look like, our sin being put on Christ, there's nothing more beautiful than Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And listen, he was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted on our behalf. He paid the penalty for our sin. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's the first end of the imputed sin to Christ. Think how amazing that is, that the God who created us, the God who we have sinned against, the God who we have sinned in so many different ways, might commend his love towards us in such a way that he would give his own dear son to pay the penalty for wicked sinners like you and I. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was, a stri he was stricken. Even right there that he would call us my people. We're God's people. When he died on that cross to pay your sin, he had you. This idea of election and predestination in understanding scripture right is that, that God, it, the, 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 the death that Christ died was effectual. It was for a particular people that before you were ever created and you began to go off in sinning, that he knew you and that Christ died for you before the foundations of the earth and made that propitiation. By his knowledge, and here's the other part of it, that's the sin imputed. Now Isaiah will show us the righteous part that's imputed to the believer. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So there's a bearing of our iniquities for Christ, and there is a righteousness imputed. It's twofold. It's twofold. It has to be. It's not enough just that we might be forgiven, because you know what? We keep sinning more and more and more. There's going to need to be a righteousness. There's going to be a needing to be made right. Just that word, made right. Justification, just as if we had never sinned. It has to be. God's that holy. Otherwise, he could never even look upon us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Back to that very wonderful paragraph. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace. It has to be freely, and it has to be by his grace. Here's the means, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. Again, the means by which we are able to attain this. So now Paul, who was heidi tidy and a Pharisee, and a, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was the, one of the most intelligent and scholarly men of that first century. He began to understand what really mattered. Not who you are, but who you are in Christ. Not who you are and the giftings you have and the life you lead, but what God has done for you in Christ. So Paul would say this, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God, through faith. He realized there was nothing about him that was special. If anything, all the things that he was proud of, he just counted them as dumb. He just, he recognized he's nothing. So this is where when you think about Onesimus, when you think about Philemon, Philemon had it all. He was rich probably beyond measure. He was a leader in his town. His slave Onesimus had nothing. And you know what? At the foot of the cross, they're equal. They both have it all through this imputed righteousness in Christ. Peter would put it this way. 
to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gospel is so wonderful, but it's not just a little simple say a prayer and you're saved. Folks, we got to get deep in and understand what we have in God. A.W. Pink says this, commenting on God's reckoning. This reckoning is this uh, imputed righteousness, this accounting, this making the account level again with God. He says this about God's reckoning righteousness to the believer. It is called the righteousness of God. We saw that in Romans 1.17. Because in Romans 3.21, because he is the appointer, approver, and imputer of it. It is called the righteousness of God and our Savior Christ, as Peter said, because he wrought it out and presented it unto God. It is called the righteousness of faith because faith is the apprehender and receiver of it. It is called man's righteousness because it was paid for him and imputed to him. All these varied expressions refer to so many aspects of that one perfect obedience unto death, which the Savior performed for his people. Amen. Jesus obeyed the law in every point, yet voluntarily went to the cross to pay for our sins. The only perfect sinless sacrifice. And then that's not enough. That righteousness that he's won for us and walked out, he gives that to us. And then, by the way, he calls us his children. Uh, John Murray, in his wonderful book, Redemption, Accomplished and Applied, says this, God cannot but accept into his favor those who are invested with the righteousness of his own son. Think about that, because so many times people think they, 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 they doubt their salvation. A lot of times people will doubt their salvation. If, if you're thinking of yourself, I see why you doubt it. But if your focus is on Christ and what he has accomplished, you'll never doubt it. So that's why Murray says, God cannot but accept into his favor those who are invested with the righteousness of his own son. While his wrath is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, his good pleasure is also revealed from heaven upon the righteousness of his well-beloved and only begotten, of which we are his well-beloved as well, and begotten through Christ and made right with God. Again, MacArthur, God thus justifies the ungodly, not by simply disregarding their sin, but having imputed our sin to Christ, who paid the penalty in full. He now reckons Christ's righteousness to us. God could never wink at sin. But God credits the believer's sin to Christ's account. He can, cre he can then credit Christ's righteousness to the believer's account. God cannot have justly credited righteousness to Abraham that he had not, if he had not uh, Abraham's sin. Let me say that again. Because God credits the believer's sin to Christ's account, he can credit Christ's righteousness to the believer's account. God could not have justly credited righteousness to Abraham had not Abraham's sin, like every believer's sin, been paid for by the sacrifice of Christ's own blood. That's why it all points to that one moment in history for everybody who dies in faith, before and after, back to the cross. Before the cross, the believer's sin was paid in anticipation of Christ's atoning sacrifice, and since the cross, the believer's sin has been paid for in advance, end quote. So we've got to understand what God has done for us in Christ, that he has paid the full penalty for us. And then he is imputed a righteousness. It's just so glorious how God has done this. Who could have ever imagined it? That's why for the Jews it was a stumbling block. For the Greeks it's foolishness. What? A man died on a Roman cross? And that makes me right with God? Yes. Yes. Miraculously and wonderfully. Your sin has been paid and this perfect life that was offered is then offered to us. So in a nutshell, this is substitutionary atonement applied through imputation. Our sins are imputed or reckoned to Christ, and his righteousness is imputed or reckoned to the believer. It's all of grace, it's all of God, and it's all for his glory. God is good. Let's look at the final point here. Blessed are the righteous. Look at verse 7 and 8. Blessed are those who law, whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. How wonderful is that? Blessed, happy, flourishing are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. How could a perfectly holy God ever forgive lawless sinners like you and me? This is how, and this is how we are blessed and able truly to flourish. We now are made right with this holy God. We now have our lawlessness rectified with the chief lawgiver. Jesus kept the law on our behalf and paid for our breaking the law so that now we are forgiven and blessed. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Our sins are covered over by the blood of Christ. Though your sins should be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. I don't know if you ever got blood on a white t-shirt. Blood doesn't come out, I found out. Blood, blood stains, and it's there forever. But this is the kind of blood that fully and totally cleanses from sin. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, Forgiveness is only the negative aspect, and God never stops at that. God always goes on. God is never satisfied with anything less than reconciliation. It wasn't enough just to forgive Onesimus. Take him in as your brother. Now and forever, God never stops short just to forgive. God always goes on. God is never satisfied with anything less than reconciliation. So Paul's interpretation of David's psalm is right for this reason, that forgiveness is the first step in the process that leads to full reconciliation. So if you have salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you're also going to have sanctification, and you're going to be guaranteed glorification. Amen. It's a fate to complete. We're going to work it and walk it out, and it's going to look like we're doing it, but it's going to be God carrying us every step of the way. But this is just where it starts. That's why it's so sad for people to just start here and never go on from here. For perhaps, again, Paul, about Onesimus, perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, both in the flesh and in the Lord. God is so good. Martin Lloyd-Jones, it is Paul himself who says constantly that redemption means justification, sanctification, and final deliverance glorification. Redemption includes everything, and yet he seems to describe it here as if it were just the forgiveness of sins. That is merely, again, a matter of speech. He knows that the first steps implies all the others. If God takes the first step, he always takes all the steps. End quote. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Again, I don't have that English accent to make it sound so cool. But here's the deal. Paul said it so many years ago. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So as you sit here today, I think about Paul and everything he counted valuable. I don't know what you value most in your life. I don't know if it's your job, if it's your home, if it's your property. I don't know if it's your children you value most. I don't know what you most value or what you most feel fortunate for, but I submit to you that if you don't have your sins forgiven, even if you were the richest man in the world or you had all the health you could possibly imagine, you have nothing if you're at odds with the living God. Mm -hmm. But if you've been forgiven through Christ and your lawless deeds are forgiven, you have it all. So it doesn't much matter what will happen along the way. It's all going to be a guarantee. You know where it's going to end? In glory. It's going to end in the presence of the living God forever and ever and ever. It's going to end with a glorified body in which I'll get my fingertip back. It's going to end in a glorified body in which we're going to hang out with Ralph. And Ralph's going to be dancing. He'll have that leg back. It's so glorious that if we've been saved and our lawless deeds have been forgiven, we are of all men most to be envied. We are blessed. So in conclusion, I want to just look, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 61, 10, and 11. 
Did you read that, John, in the call to worship? Isaiah 61, let's look at that quickly. Isaiah 61, 10 and 11, and it so beautifully kind of describes our final song, this idea of his robes for mine. You know, you think about how dirty and disgusting and stinky our clothing is before God, and he takes that stinking, dirty, disgusting robes of unrighteousness and then clothes us with, with beautiful garments of salvation. I will rejoice, Isaiah says, in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. We're going to look more next week at how Abraham was called to be the father of many nations. This gospel is carrying righteousness and truth and changing people all over this globe. This robes of righteousness. And just as we call the musicians forward, I just want to read, uh, turn to page 181 in your hymnals as the musicians come forward. This is so beautiful, these words. His robes for mine. His robes for mine, a wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. Bought by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. Verse 3 reads this way. For his robes for mine, God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father is pleased. Christ drank God's wrath on sin, then cried, "'Tis done. Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost." Please stand with me. Turn to page 181. His robe.